All right, so let's get started. Um, yeah, so hello, um, my name is Freddie, and today I'm going to talk to you all about a Python library called PyTorch. Um, so just a little bit about me. Uh, like, my, like I said, my name is Freddie. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'm a Costa Rican American that was born and raised in Boston. I'm still living here. Um, and before or in the past, uh, I used to work at a couple of different startups in quantitative finance, agriculture, and e-commerce. But, um, but now I'm working at a company called GitHub, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and uh, I'm working in the AI and data org where a lot of my work is related to helping other teams at GitHub uh, use data to improve their products and make data-driven decisions. Um, outside of work, I really like mechanical keyboards, playing soccer and watching soccer, of course, uh, video games. Um, right now, I am really enjoying this new, not new game, but a new to me game called Risk of Rain. And uh, I also collect hobbies. So there's a bunch of stuff here that I'm also interested in that I'm not listing here because it would probably take up too much space. And in regards to keyboards, uh, keyboard on the left here, uh, and this slide is the one that I currently use, and it's very small. It's only got 58 keys. So um, yeah, I built that myself. Um, and then before we get into PyTorch and talk about that, uh, I just want to put a couple of disclaimers. Um, first disclaimer is that I am not an expert at PyTorch. Uh, I've used it you know, many times. I don't use this every single day at work. This is not part of like my, my daily thing. Um, so, uh, but I can talk about it and I can, I think I can run a workshop on it. So uh, that being said, this workshop will also not make you a PyTorch expert. So uh, it will get you like, you know, introduced to the basic concepts and, um, and then you can, you know, spend time learning it on your own. Uh, I do not think that even if I was an expert, that one hour would give me, would be enough time to make everybody else an expert. Um, yeah, and then uh, related to that, PyTorch is really fun to use. And if you want to learn more, there's going to be some uh, links I'll post at the end with some resources if you're interested in, in continuing with it. Uh, and then also a couple of assumptions here. So, you know, I'm familiar with the Bytes and Pieces YouTube channel. So I know that people have been introduced to machine learning at some point and have been introduced to programming at some point if you've attended previous talks. Um, so my assumption, first assumption is that you're familiar with Python or another programming language. Now, my second assumption is that you've heard, you've at least heard of vectors and or matrices, or you've had a class where you've like done some vector or matrix math. Um, and then the third assumption is that you know something about machine learning but I don't expect people to be an expert. Um, and you know, if you have questions about ML in general, we can talk about that at the end. But for now, we're gonna focus on PyTorch specifically. Okay, so agenda. Um, so uh, that should say four, five, six at the end, but there's gonna be six sections. Um, the first is I'm just gonna talk about what is PyTorch and why would you use it? Or, and how it kind of compares to other frameworks. Uh, the, that's the second part. The third part is uh, basics with tensors, and which is basically considered the building block of a lot of machine learning libraries. And PyTorch specifically uses the term tensors, but you know you could substitute that term with you know arrays or matrices or vectors. Um, then we we'll talk about data sets and data loaders. So how do you actually get data to use for your machine learning modeling process? Uh, we'll do some transforms or look at some transforms on data sets, and then we will look at an example of a PyTorch neural network and how you build one. With, uh, that's not necessarily good, but how you build one in general. So what is PyTorch? Uh, so according to Wikipedia, PyTorch is a machine learning framework used for applications such as computer vision and natural language processing, originally developed by Meta AI and now part of the Linux Foundation umbrella. Um, and, uh, so that's quite Wikipedia. Uh, the way that I would describe it in my own words is PyTorch is a machine learning library, uh, in Python using the Python ecosystem. And it was built on top of and inspired by 
this other machine learning library called Torch, um, hence the name PyTorch, Python and Torch. Um, and uh, yeah, it's one of the most popular libraries for building uh, neural networks now. But PyTorch is also an ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot of tools that people have built on top of it um, for various tasks. So people have used it for natural language processing, computer vision, recommender systems, uh, 3D reconstruction. Uh, they've also built tools on top of it for large scale data processing. Um, and they've also, people have also built tools on it for general machine learning, not necessarily specific to deep learning. Um, but it's, yeah, it's kind of grown into this whole ecosystem of tools for different machine learning and data tasks. So uh, PyTorch uh, is just one framework that exists for doing this type of work. There's other frameworks such as Keras and TensorFlow, um, MXNet, Apache MXNet, JAX, which is you know one of the newer ones. Um, and you know, the primary differentiators between all these libraries are you know a few things, but uh, one is ecosystem maturity. So what that means is how many people are building tools using this this library. Um, how many people have built tools in specific ways? Are people building more tools in PyTorch, using PyTorch for embedded systems, or are they building them more for uh, computer vision? Um, how long has this been happening? Uh, so if you compare it to like TensorFlow, for example, I believe TensorFlow was publicly released a year or two before PyTorch was. Um, so, you know, TensorFlow has had you know, a couple more years of being out in the public for people to utilize. Uh, uh, another example is APIs and ease of use. So some people just really like PyTorch because they find it easier to use than TensorFlow or MXNet or whatever. There's like, you know, probably another 20 machine learning frameworks that people might know about, uh, and then many, many smaller ones. Uh, another piece is performance. So um, PyTorch has been pretty much considered better for a long time for working across many, many GPUs compared to other frameworks. And, um, but there are other things like TensorFlow that have a lot of support and development for embedded systems. So lots of people built tools for TensorFlow to run on mobile devices. And PyTorch, I think, has not really had as much focus there. And another factor is funding. So, you know, a lot of these deep learning frameworks or machine learning frameworks are built by and funded by big, tech companies that have billions of dollars and you know can hire huge teams of people to support these things. Um, whereas you know something much smaller like somebody's personal machine learning library that they built uh, might not have that because it's just one person. So uh, like I said, historically PyTorch has been better for working across many, many GPUs and doing this large scale data processing before you do modeling, but a lot of other frameworks are making these types of improvements. So. Um, that might leave you thinking like, when, when should you actually use PyTorch? Like, why would you use it over one over the other, one framework over the other? And the answer that I feel like I've arrived at is, is that if you feel like you're more comfortable with PyTorch, um, then that's a great reason to use it. Or if you feel like it fits your problem better, that's another good reason to use it. I think there's a lot of debates about which machine learning libraries are better. And I think the answer is, like most things, it depends um, on a lot of the, on a lot of factors. Uh, but yeah, so PyTorch is growing though. Uh, so there's this blog post that was put up by a company called Assembly AI. They do some work in NLP, or natural language processing, and I basically did this analysis of uh, repositories created on GitHub and other places. Um, and you can see in this little graph here that on the red that this uh, this slice of red is is getting bigger. Um, so uh, and the orange slice being TensorFlow and the blue slice being other. So anything that's not PyTorch or TensorFlow uh, are getting smaller. Um, yeah, a lot of people love to use PyTorch also for research purposes because they feel like they can get it started with it faster. But um, yeah, you can check out that blog post if you're interested in more info there. So I keep talking to you about PyTorch. I'm telling you about all this and 
you know, trying to build some kind of mental model about why you might use it or why you might not use it. Um, but I think the best way to like get an understanding for that is to actually uh, run some PyTorch code and and use it. So um, I'm going to, so we're going to transition now into some PyTorch basics, and we're going to talk about tensors using Google Colab. And uh, I was saying this earlier before I started recording, but if you haven't used Google Colab before, it's a uh, free software created by Google, built on this technology called Jupyter Notebooks, where you can run pieces of code uh, in kind of any order you want, but you can run code at, uh, one, one chunk at a time and, and then kind of see the results. And it makes it really nice to, or makes it really easy to visualize what you're doing and, and uh, pick, picking out small pieces of uh, code at once. So uh, I'm going to switch my screen sharing and I'm going to post this link in the Zoom chat um, if this works properly. Okay. Uh, my screen share is loading. And I'm going to paste this link in Zoom. Oh, sorry. Can everybody see my screen? Or are you not seeing Google Colab? I think I might have shared the wrong one. Sorry, one second. How about this one? I believe this is the right one. Okay. Cool. I think I'm sharing the right thing now. So I want to copy this. I'll paste this in Zoom. Okay. So uh, yeah, like I said, we're going to talk about tensors. So uh, tensors. Tensors are kind of a general term that people start to utilize more in deep learning space for the last few years. But it comes from mathematics and it is a concept or a word to describe a way in which data is represented and stored. Um, think of it as an umbrella term for uh, different ways of representing uh, dimensions on data. So uh, zero dimensional tensors are scalars. Uh, if you've not heard this word, this means this is like Python integers and floats. So 0, 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.0564, et cetera, those are all scalars. And there's zero dimensional tensors or zero D tensors. Uh, then there's one D tensors, which are um, like vectors. So uh, zero, one, uh, 111. And these are like Python lists or analogous to Python lists. Then you have 2D tensors. And those are analogous to list of lists or two dimensional Python lists. Or in another programming language, this might be like arrays or arrays of, array, of arrays. Um, uh, but they're akin to matrices. And you can go as far as you want. You can go all the way up to n d tensors, where n is some number, uh, if you really want to. But most data uh, that you're looking at uh, or that you're going to work with in general is usually not going to be any more than uh, 3D tensors. Um, so that would be lists of lists of lists. Um, and we'll look at an example of that later. That's kind of hard to visualize. But um, you can create tensors really easily in PyTorch. Uh, so the first thing that you do anytime using PyTorch is you do you type import torch. And if you're in Colab, you can hit shift enter to run this, or you can hit the play uh, button, and it should run this cell here. And I don't know if this is going to be done running. It looks like it's still running. So we'll give this a second. But um, let's pretend that's done. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a typical Python 2D list, two-dimensional list. So a list that has two lists in it. And it the first list has 0 and 1. And the second list has 2 and 3. And what we do to convert it to a tensor is we can use the torch tensor function. So you can say torch, you can type out torch.sensor, tensor, sorry, and pass it the data. And we're going to assign it to a variable called x. And then you can print that out. And you should see that it is a tensor. 
and it has the same values and it has these two opening brackets. And that's how you make a tensor. Um, so it's pretty simple uh, to do that. But uh, tensors actually have some attributes on them. So uh, there's a bunch of them, but the three primary the three primary attributes are the shape. So this tells you how many rows and columns uh, that a tensor has. You have the data type or the D type, which is the type of the data that's being stored. So uh, that might be in 64s, in 32s, float 32s, um, or 64-bit integers, depending on what your familiarity is with different programming languages. Uh, and uh, the third attribute is uh, the device. So this says, where is the data being stored? Like, where, where, do we, where do we know the data is living so we can do stuff with it? And uh, usually this means it's a CPU or it's a GPU. And uh, PyTorch usually refers to the GPUs as CUDA because it's a programming language that's used for GPUs. Um, so you can view the attributes of uh, the X tensor that we just made by printing out x.shape, x.dtype, and x.device. So if we look at these, you can see that there is uh, a size associated with this, or sorry, this is printing out torch.size, and it's saying that the size is 2, 2. So it's two rows, two columns. Uh, it also has a dtype. So these are 64-bit integers. Um, we have that, that is the default. So if you want to make them 32-bit integers, there's some code you can run to change that. And the last piece is the device, which is the CPU. And again, that's also the, def the default. Uh, if you want, you can also create tensors made up of random values or constant values. So if you want to make a tensor of all zeros, let's first basically say, what do we want the shape to be? So if we want it to be five by five, we can pass a or create a tuple of, that says five comma five. And then we can create a 2D tensor of all zeros using the torch.zeros method. And if we run that, you can see this is five by five, five zeros across, five zeros down. You can also do this with ones. So you can use the torch.ones method. And we can also do it with a bunch of random values. That's all the same shape as the previous ones. So pass it the shape that you want, and you can do torch.rand. And you can see there's uh, these kind of like random looking values. And if we run this again, it changes every time. So, um, so that's how you make tensors uh, in general. And that's how you can utilize some of the functions for tensors if you care about zeros, ones, or some kind of constant values. But um, so we're going to move on to op tensor operations. Um, so if you have a tensor, you can do a bunch of different things with it. Uh, similarly to Python lists, you can slice your tensors. So if you create a tensor that has values one through uh, 10, you can use the list of range one through 11 to get that and then create this tensor and you can slice it using the slicing syntax. Uh, if you're not familiar with Python, slicing syntax says, where do you want your slice to start? So at what value will you start? You use colon, what value you want to end at. And if you want to skip uh, certain uh, values, you can say, I want to skip every two or every other value or every third value or every fourth. But in this case, we're just going to do up to the third. So that gets, that gets us one, two, and three. We can also create a 2D tensor and slice it row-wise or column-wise. So if we make a tensor that has the numbers one through nine, each with three, uh, sorry, one through nine with three rows, three numbers in each row, we can get just the first row by passing zero, comma, colon. Zero is the zeroth row because zero indexed in Python. 
comma, all the, all the columns. So this says how many rows, how many columns. So again, we get one, two, three. We can also get the first column. So we can use colon to get all the rows and get the first column or the zeroth column, one, four, and seven. We can also get the first row and then the first and third values in the row. So first row, this is like saying zero and then everything else. And this gives us the first row, skips the second value, gets the last value because there's only three. We can also get the first and the third row and the first and third value in the rows. So if you do colon, colon, two, colon, colon, two for the rows and the columns, we get one, three, seven, nine, which are the corners of this matrix or this 2D tensor or this 2D Python list, whatever term you want to use. Okay, so th those are some list operations or list-like operations. There's also linear algebra operations we can do. So if you want to do summation or multiplication, Torch has, or PyTorch has some functions provided to you that let you do this. So if we take our 1D tensor that we made above and we sum up all the values in it, remembering that the 1D tensor has values one through 10, you can use torch.sum, name of the 1D tensor, and we get back a tensor. Again, this one's a scalar tensor or a zero D tensor and the value is 55. We could also take the 1D tensor and we can sum it with itself and see that it still has 10 values. So you, if you use the torch.add method, you can pass it the name of the first tensor and the name of the second tensor. And because these are the same, we're gonna have 10 values still and the resulting tensor at the end is double the value of the original one. So it's one plus one, two plus two, three plus three. This is vector math. So anytime you add vectors together, you add them, uh, you add the numbers uh, that are in the same position, but the vectors have to be the same length. If these vectors were not the same length, then this wouldn't work the same way. Actually, I don't think this would work at all. And you can see that we still have a shape of 10 or a size of 10. And we can also do the same thing for our 2D tensor. So you can add these two, the 2D tensor to itself, print it out and we get two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, double, double each number essentially. And we can see the size is still uh, three by three. Now, what about multiplication? So uh, if you haven't done matrix multiplication before, the way that multiplication works or the, the general rule for multiplication is if you have one tensor or one matrix, and another tensor and another matrix, the first one, the first matrix has to have a shape of M, M by N, where M is the number of rows and N is the number of columns. The second matrix, or the second tensor, needs to have a shape of N by P, where N is the number of rows and P is the number of columns. And so the reason for this is that if you try to multiply two matrices that don't have this overlapping N, like the same number for n, you can't actually do multiplication. It doesn't work. If you want to know why, then uh, I would suggest Googling it um, because I don't want to spend time talking about why you can't do matrix multiplication in that scenario because this, we're going to focus on PyTorch. Um, yeah, so if so, we're going to use our 2D matrix. We're going to look at its shape. It's three by three, so it's it's M is three, it's N is three. The second tensor we're gonna make is also going to have a shape of N by P. N, N by P. So in this scenario it has three, uh, sorry, two rows and three columns. So that's actually two by three. So the value N doesn't actually line up. So this comment here is saying this matrix, the second matrix, doesn't actually have n equals three rows. So an easy way to do that is we can rotate it or do a transpose of this. 
and the syntax for that is uh, dot t. This shows up in a lot of different libraries like NumPy or Pandas. And so anytime you're doing matrix math and you need to uh, multiply two matrices and you need to line up those n values, you can transpose one of them. And if we uh, take this transposed version and we look at the shape, it's now three, two. And then the way to multiply the two tensors together is we can take the name of the first tensor. That tensor has a method on it called matmul matrix multiplication. And it takes in another tensor, our transpose matrix. And so when we run the cell, we get back a matrix that ends up with uh, three rows and two columns. So we get back an M by P matrix or an M by P 2D tensor. And uh, I'm not going to check my math on this because I'm just certain that this is right. Uh, if you want to do a quick one, um, you can do this out on paper, but it doesn't actually go, you don't actually take two and then multiply it by 10. It's some like, combination of multiplication and addition. But anyways, the point is, if you want to multiply two matrices two or two 2D tensors, this is how you can do it. Tensor one dot matmul tensor two. If you don't want to remember that, the, that there's a matmul method, you can also do 2D with the at symbol and the name of the second, uh, the second matrix, transpose matrix, and get the same result. Okay, I'm going to pause there for a second. Anybody have any questions? Feel free to put them in chat or just speak up. Okay, I'll take the silence as a continuation point. Yes, so like, you know, um, so like, stuff on, um, so I, so like if you wanted to like if you wanted to get like the um if you wanted to like some um, like um different tensors like say you had like um two four six and like say ten like fresh I don't know how to do that. Sorry. So your question is, if you have two different tensors and you want to add them together that are different sizes? Um, yeah. Yeah. So you can do the same thing. Um, you can look at an example. Uh, maybe like, let me create a new cell here. Let's, uh, let's take this one. We'll take our 1D tensor, which is, you know, 1 through 10. And then if I add uh, like five to it, like a tensor with five torch dot tensor of five, it just, the way that this works is you, in your second tensor, you take five and then you just apply it to every single value in the first tensor. So, okay. yeah, so if they're not this, if they're not the same size, so maybe I think what I was saying earlier, I forgot this example, but yeah, if you have two tensors that are different sizes, uh, if one is just one value, you can go ahead and add that to the, the, the first tensor. Okay. Okay. Shall we move on? I'm going to continue now. All right, so uh, now we're gonna talk about an example of a real world tensor. Um, so we're gonna take this stock image of a very cute looking cat, a little orange cat, and we're gonna show how it's represented as a tensor. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a, some code. If you don't really understand everything that's going on here, that's okay. Um, this code is gonna download this image off the internet, and we're going to store it as a Python object. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use this transforms module inside the torch vision library 
So this is another PyTorch library within the ecosystem. And we're going to uh, use this two tensor method. And this two tensor method is going to convert this image to a tensor. So this is what this cat image looks like as a tensor. Um, can anybody tell me how many dimensions this tensor has? Either in chat or with words. And I'll wait like 10 seconds. If not, then I will actually tell you the answer. Three. Three, yep. That's correct. Yep. So this is a three-dimensional tensor. And the way that this works, if you're not familiar with images, is that oh, my trick that I always use is look at the how many open brackets there are after this tensor uh, like annotation here. So one, two, three, three dimensions. Uh, another thing to know is that all images are three-dimensional tensors because Images are made of up of a red layer, a green layer, and a blue layer. So they're all represented as matrices. Um, so yeah, three dimensions. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of the end of the second section uh, and the tensor basics. Um, there's a you know bunch of other operations you can do. You can do in-place operations. Uh, you can go ahead and do like subtraction if you need to, because we just focus on summation. But if you want to go see what all the remaining operations are, then I would encourage you to check out the official PyTorch tutorial, which are, where it covers all that. Or take this notebook and play around with it. Um, if you're interested in tensors in general or matrix math in general, there's another library called NumPy. And it's focused on pretty much mostly array and matrix operations. There are some other things that supports other mathematical operations, but um, all the NumPy operations can translate to PyTorch really easily. But if you're interested in matrix math, then NumPy is a good place to uh, look at. Okay. Uh, let me jump back to my slides. Um, so the next thing, and you know, I just have this in the notebook, so I'm gonna jump over to the no notebook. But the next thing I'm gonna talk about uh, is data sets and data loaders. So data sets and, uh, the data sets and data loaders section is about managing and iterating through data sets. Because in any machine learning project, you want to split up any analysis and processing you're doing of your data from actual model training and, and model building. Data problems and machine learning problems or modeling problems can be really difficult in their own regards, as you, especially as you work on more complex things. Um, so to make it easier to you know, kind of tackle problems independently, PyTorch has some Python classes you can use or some classes you can use specifically for data management. The first one is called Dataset. It allows you to store any of your data as tensors. So you can take any images you might have in a data set or any images you might have on your machine and convert those to tensors, for example. Uh, then there's also the data loader. Oh, sorry. The, another example would be like audio data or something like that. But um, I was just using images as the primary one. The, the second class is the data loader class. And that allows you to access and iterate through the data so that you can then feed it into your model training code um, and your modeling code. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to import a few libraries. Uh, one is the PIL library, which lets us read in images. We used it in the last notebook. Another one is matplotlib. This is for graphing, so we can look at some stuff, look at some data. Now we're going to import torch, uh, import the dataset class, import the datasets module, and the transformers module, which we used last notebook as well, briefly. And PyTorch has a bunch of different datasets that you can uh, download or import and use already without having to use your own custom data set or build your own custom data set. And usually people use these as toy examples or a way to uh, test out a library. They download the data set, they build a neural network or build a machine learning model 
using the library and then they they say okay can i i've, I've done this maybe i've done this before and like tensorflow and i got like 98 percent accuracy or something you know can i do this in pytorch and and how easy is it or what does it look like to do that in pytorch or you might say i've never used pytorch before uh and i have no idea where to get data so you, this is also a great way to uh, get started with PyTorch quickly instead of having to search the internet for your own data set and, and set it up um, and build your own custom data set. So we're going to look at the Oxford IIIT pet data set. And this is a data set that comes from the Visual Geometry Group at Oxford University. And what this is, is uh, it has some images of different breeds of cats and dogs. And it also has um, labels. Uh, so, uh, for, the, for example, the, it has a bunch of images of Bengal cats, and then it has a label that says, or a, a column that says, this cat, this image of this cat is a Bengal, or this image of this dog is a beagle. So, it has about 7,400 images or so with 37, 37 different breeds um, or classes or labels or whatever term you want to use of animals. Uh, and what we're going to do eventually is try to classify or infer what breed, what breed a dog or cat is given an image. But yeah, so focusing on the data set portion, um, we can use the Torch Vision Datasets module. And we're going to do datasets.oxford.iit pet. And this takes in four uh, parameters, or we're going to use four parameters here. The first one is the location of where the data is going to be downloaded. Uh, the next is getting the training data, downloading the data from the internet, and then you're going to convert all the images to tensors with a transform. So if we run this, I'm not actually going to rerun this because it's going to download it off the internet. That takes like a couple minutes, uh, but I, re I ran it before. So uh, if you print out this training data and see that it's got a data set. Okay. Uh, we can also get the, and this is for the training data specifically. We can also get test data. And the only thing that we change here is we change the split. The split parameter takes in test instead of train val in this scenario. And if we print this out again, we see that this has a different number of data points. It's stored in the root, like the root location is dot, which is the current directory. And it uses this standard uh, two tensor transform. So what that means is all of our images are gonna automatically get converted to tensors. So if we just look at tensors all day and any kind of machine learning problem, we're gonna have no idea what animals are really seeing or like what the data looks like. So we can go ahead and show some of the images along with their labels. The training data class that we have now, the data set class has a class to IDX to index uh, attribute on it. So if we print that out, we see that Abyssinian is the zeroth label, American Bulldog is the oneth label. So this has like the actual name and then the numerical value corresponding to the label. And there's 37, uh, that's because it's zero label zero indexed. Um, so if we take a look at the first image in its label, uh, we can use, we can actually get the first image by using indexing on the training data. Um, so print this out. You can see that it's a tuple with a tensor and the second value in the tuple is zero. So that seems to indicate that this is an Abyssinian, the tensor value of an Abyssinian image. Um, we can prove this by getting the tensor, getting the label, and using our plotting library and the transforms library or the transforms module to convert that tensor to an image. Um, to me, I don't actually, I can't actually confirm this Abyssinian, but if I looked at, you know, images of Abyssinians, uh, I can't actually see that. Oh, interesting. Uh, these cats look somewhat similar. They're like orange, uh, but it's also possible that's wrong. So uh, we can keep looking at more examples. So print out the label at zero. Uh, we can see the label name programmatically. 
And now we can go ahead and do the same thing. Getting the image, the label, getting its actual class name and converting it to an image. And we're gonna do that for the first five images. So we're gonna put this in for loop. Uh, so it's pretty much the exact same as the code was above, except we're doing it for five images now, for the first five. So here's an Abyssinian, another Abyssinian, another one. And I don't even know if I'm saying Abyssinian, right? But these, these look more like the cats that were on this web, this web page here. So that's, that's good. Um, another thing in data problems is to make sure that the data set is accurate and that it actually has what it claims that it has. So uh, we can look at the last image just to make sure we don't have all Abyssinians in our data set. And we can do the same thing by taking our training data, indexing it using the negative one index, which means the last value in Python, and uh, print it out uh, like image version or the image, the printed version or plotted version of the image rather than the tensor version. And you can see that the last image we have is a Yorkshire Terrier. So that gives us some confidence that this data set is really what it claims to be. Um, okay, so that's, that's it with data sets. Like you can index them to get different, different uh, images and their labels. You can use some methods to print them out and convert them to you know, plots and you can loop over it however you want. And there's some attributes that, you know, that are on here as well, but that's not really important um, to what we're looking at right now. The most important thing is uh, I think instead of writing all the code that we had to write above to loop through the images, get the images, label them, et cetera, we can use the PyTorch data loader class, which is really convenient and allows you to do the same thing in fewer lines of code. Uh, so this time we're going to use a different data set called Fashion MNIST, has a bunch of clothing items and uh, the labels saying what type of clothing are they. And there's a particular reason why we're not looking at the pet data set again, but I'll talk about that in a second. Or I'll talk about that really in the next uh, notebook. But so we can import the data loader with torch utils torch .utils data import data loader, get our training data set, uh, the fashion MNIST training data set. And then we create a training data loader and it takes in the training data. Uh, batch size, which indicates how many images we want to kind of group together. Do you want to consider it to be one batch of images or one grouping? And we'll shuffle them. So the images won't be in order of, of in the same order that they are in the data set when we download it. That's just, so that's really more of like a convenience and there's not really a particular reason why we're going to utilize that, but just to show you that you can actually get like this different order. Um, and we're gonna skip over the test data loader. We don't need that. It's just, we're gonna look at how to use this. Um, so to display the, and get the first image and its label using the data loader, we can use these two Python built-ins. The first being iter, which uh, places a pointer at uh, the, first value, the first time you run it, or the first image in the data loader, because the data loader has the data set. It took it in the data set as part of its parameters. And then we can call next on iter, which returns the value to us. And we can get back the train images and the training labels. Uh, and then we can, again, do train images of zero to get the zeroth image. We're gonna use this squeeze squeeze method, which takes the image and makes it so that we can plot it on a 2D plot instead of like 3D. Um, and we can get the label by getting the zero training label, train label, and then we can use our plotting library. So this is like five lines of code compared to, I don't know, maybe like similarly like kind of five lines of code, but we had to kind of figure it out for ourselves and like know more about the data set class. But then if we want to iterate through this, you know, this is how many lines? One, two, I don't know, like 10 lines or so. So that kind of 
drops it down by like half. Um, and if we run this cell, um, I need to actually define this. And I, like I said, I, this is going to download again. So let's see how fast that is. This one's pretty quick. So I'm not worried about downloading it. Let that finish up. And day letter is not defined because I didn't import that. Great. This is called training data loader. You can see that maybe I ran this before and then forgot to rename things. Yeah, so here's the first image. And if we run the cell again, this iter, next iter, uh, function chaining that we're doing here will give us another image. So now you can see another one that's different. And we can go ahead and do this again and again. And then we can get these labels here. So that's data loaders. So there, there's not a whole lot involved with these things, with these data sets and data loaders. It's just get the, it's focused on getting the data and allowing you to iterate through them. And you can use your plotting libraries to see that, what they look like. Um, so we're going to now look at transforms and how are we doing on time? So we got about 10 minutes left. So we might go a little bit over. Feel free to stick around or not. Um, we're going to look at transforms. And anytime we're working with a new data set, we need to look at the data that we have and expect it before training our models like we were doing before. But oftentimes for images specifically, we might look for inconsistencies depending on our problem. Uh, we might want to see if all the images are in color or if they're all grayscale or if they're a mix. Uh, we want, might want to see if all the images are the same size. Do all of the image is also have the correct label? You know, this is part of like the data problems and whether or not you want to check these things depends on the problem you're looking at. But um, uh, it might be beneficial to look at these things. So we're going to uh, import again these all the same code to get all of the uh, data set that we want for the pet data set. So this is all the exact same code, all the same thing for the data loader, the data set, et cetera. And uh, what we're trying to do here is get the first image in the training data set using this code, that this like iter code that we had before. And if we run this code on this data set, the pet data set, we're actually going to get an error back. The error says stack expects each tensor to be equal size, but got three, four, eight, 500 entry zero and three, 300, 296 entry one. Where this comes from is the batch size. So when I was talking about batches before and treating data like a batch or a grouping, uh, the data loader, if you pass, uh, pass it a batch size of a number that's greater than one, then it will stick, you know, that number of images together. Now, the batch size determines how PyTorch automatically slices up your data set. So, you, you know, so you can do this like processing of batches and stuff. Um, and if your data, and if your batch size is greater than one, you have to have your images be the same dimensions. By default, you can change this if you want to. Like there are ways to, to change this about, um, like if you make your own custom data loader. But if you use the default data loader class and you have a batch size greater than one, all images must have the same dimensions. So what kind of options do we have to fix this? Uh, we kind of have two options. First option is we can change the batch size to be one. So we can look at one image at a time or slice it up to, you know, one, one group is one image. And, uh, and then we can run the same code and you can see that we actually get the image out and, you know, it looks perfectly fine. So that's, that's totally valid to do. Problem is, is that might be really slow if you have, you know, a million images going one at a time or in your processing that in your model. So um, instead, something we can do is keep our batch size at 64 and instead use a transform to 
turn all of the images to be the same size or change all the images to be the same size. So before we had this transform parameter in this data set. And originally we had this transforms.toTensor method to automatically turn images into tensors. But what if you want to do multiple transformations? Well, the transforms module uh, has a compose uh, class or a compose, I guess, yeah, this is a class. And you can pass it a list of transforms that you want to do. So we can pass it the first transform that we had, which is the two tensor transform. And then we can pass it a second transform, which is transforms.resize. So this will tell PyTorch to, when it's processing images, to resize the image to be of the shape 300 by 300 pixels, because that's the unit we're working with, or 300 by 300 uh, values. So if we do that for our training data and get, you know, have store it in this training data variable, we can use the same data look code as before. Again, exact same code minus one thing, which is we need to permute the image because plots are 2D and images are 3D tensors. Um, I, there's some caveat here that I don't have time to explain, but uh, we can see that this dog with the batch size of 64, this code doesn't break. We don't get a runtime error. We don't get any errors here. And we can actually plot this dog. But it looks a little squished. Um, so what I want you to think about is, you know, if there's any reasons you might not want to resize all of your images. Excuse me. Um, you want to like retain quality like resolution? Yep. 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 That's definitely one reason. Exactly. Yeah. So one reason, like Max has stated that, yeah, if you want to retain quality of your images, you might not want to resize them all. Um, and there's, a, there's a, another, another reason might be that if you build a neural network, you might want it to be able to handle images of different sizes. Uh, you also, uh, in regards to resolution, you know, you can upscale, like you can have like high resolution or low resolution, you know, there's things you can do to these images, you know, aside from just changing the size. Uh, any guesses as to what might happen if we made all of the images 48 by 48 pixels? Because right now we're making them 300 by 300. But if we made them 48 by 48, any guess as to what might happen there? Uh, resolution wouldn't be as good. Yeah, the resolution would not be as good. All the images would be look kind of squished. Um, you know, you won't be able to see as many details, and you'll kind of just see this like blurry blob of the original image. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to PyTorch, making neural nets with PyTorch. And I just realized I didn't paste these links. So the slides should be shared, I believe. Julia shared them. So um, the, the links are in the slides. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about neural networks, building neural networks with PyTorch. And um, so now that we've seen how to load data and, some, and we're aware of some of the pitfalls of transforms, um, we're going to put together this neural network using our resized images, the 300 by 300 images, and see how it performs. So we're going to import all the code that we had before, all the necessary code at least. Uh, we don't need like any plotting or anything right now. And we'll have our training data, we'll have our test data, which we use to help us figure out, you know, how well our our model's doing, how well our neural network's doing. And we're going to have our training data loader and our test data loader. So it's just all familiar from the previous ones. Um, so. We're going to run, we're going to create, or sorry, we're going to import, that's what I'm looking for, the NN module, the neural network module from Torch. And when we do that, we can create our own classifier, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to create a classifier that, again, given an image, be able to determine, classify, or decide, infer what label or what class the image has. 
So every PyTorch neural network needs to implement a forward method. And the forward method is where you can apply neural network layers to your input data. So uh, we can first define this class called pet classifier, and it's a subclass of nn.module. That's how you, that is like the first line of every neural network in PyTorch. Then we're going to define an init, an init method. And the init method is where we can define all of our layers. So this first layer is our flatten layer. We're going to use the nn.flatten uh, method. And then we're going to create a linear ReLU stack. It's a type of neural network layer that uses a certain function called ReLU. Um, and, it's a, uh, and this does linear transformations on the data that we get. Uh, and we're going to use nn.sequential. I'm going to pass it a linear layer. I'm going to have some, use this ReLU function, linear layer, ReLU, linear. I won't go into detail on all these, but this is, this is a neural network that uses a few different layers sequentially and uses some linear transformations. And so this flatten here and this, these layers will take each image, flatten it from a 3D tensor with a shape of 3, 300, and 300 into a 2D tensor of shape 3 and 90,000. And then we're going to find the forward method. So the forward method will first take our input. X is whatever the input we get is. Oops, sorry. And then we're going to flatten that input. And then we're going to apply our, linear, our stack of linear ReLU functions. And then we're going to get back um, some probabilities, basically. Um, and that's going to get returned from the forward method. And that's really it for defining a neural network. There's other things you can do, but a lot of the stuff regarding building neural networks, like doing back propagation and things like that, uh, basically is taken care of for you by PyTorch. So we define this class. And once we define the, this class, we define a model, we can check to see if we have a GPU available. So our training happens quickly because GPUs are faster than CPUs. And then we'll move the neural network onto the GPU. Uh, and that's like the term that's used. Moving it onto the GPU, you're, you're saying this neural network is going to run on the GPU. That's where all the processing is going to happen. So we can use a method called torch.cuda.is available. And if we have a GPU enabled, or if we have a GPU on this notebook, or wherever you run this code, you will. Uh, get that as our device. So here we get a CUDA device. And one thing I'll point out is that at Google Colab, by default, you don't get a GPU. So the way that you get a GPU is you go to uh, runtime, change runtime type, and then hardware accelerator, you want that to say GPU. If by default it says, it will say none. If you want to use a TPU, that's a like a Google custom GPU hardware thing that I don't know much about, um, but it's also valid to use. And then you would click save. So, okay. So we're going to move this classifier onto the, onto the device. Um, this should actually just say device, but I wrote in CUDA, not really thinking too much about it. So you say, you'd, Say pet classifier, open close parens to create an instance, dot two, CUDA. And you can also print the classifier out and you can see the operations that are going to happen. And for every neural network, we also need to define a, a, a learning rate, which tells us uh, how we're going to update model parameters every time we process data, a uh, number of epochs or epics, depending on how you pronounce it, which is how many times the neural network is going to train over the entire data set to actually learn something. A uh, loss function is a, you know, being a mathematical function that says how well the neural network is doing in terms of actually learning to make predictions. So lower loss is better. And an optimizer, 
And the optimizer determines how the loss is going to be minimized in the next training session or the next training iteration. So we can define a learning rate of, we'll just go with one e to negative three. So 0 0.001, uh, if my decimal points are working correctly, uh, we'll do it. We'll go over the whole data set three times. We'll go with this loss function called cross entropy loss. And then we'll use an optimizer called stochastic gradient descent or SGD. And we'll pass it the parameters of the classifier and the learning rate. And then uh, like all machine learning algorithms, there is a training loop and there's a testing loop or there's a test training and testing portion. So uh, we can use our data loader and we can iterate over every batch that we have in our data loader or batch of images. So we can say for batch X, Y, and enumerate data loader. So our batch will be, uh, you know, our batch of images or our batch, sorry, not our batch of images, our, our batch number, like what batch we're on. And then X will be our image, Y will be the label. We wanna make sure that this data is processed also on the GPU. Okay. And then we're gonna compute some predictions using our model. And then we're gonna compute the loss on those predictions between you know, what we predicted and like what we actually have. And then we're gonna do some backpropagation here. Uh, if you're not familiar with backpropagation, I encourage you to read up on it. It is like probably the single most important uh, concept for neural networks. Uh, but the way that you do backpropagation in PyTorch is you take the optimizer, call zero grad or zero with the gradients. Uh, you take the last function, call dot backward. And then you take your optimizer and you call dot step. Okay. That's how you do backpropagation in PyTorch pretty much every single time. There's lots of special cases, I'm sure, where you might not want to do that. But because this is, you know, the most basic PyTorch stuff that we can do, this is how you do it. And then there's some code here just to print stuff out so we can see like how we're doing on the training. Uh, take, so like every 100th batch, uh, then we'll print out some stuff. We'll print out some information about our loss and see if we're, you know, lowering the, if the loss is getting lower. And then the testing loop uh, does something similar. So we uh, get our data from our data loader, the image, the label, do some predictions, compute the loss. And then we see uh, with you know, this trained model, how did, the, how did the model actually do given this brand new data that we haven't seen before? And then again, we'll have some code to print out something about our accuracy. So we, we want our loss to go down. We want our accuracy to go up. And if that's happening, that means our neural network is learning something and getting better. And so we're gonna do this over the data set three times. So we're gonna do the training loop and the testing loop one time, two times, three times. And I think I actually ran it five times in this scenario. Uh, Cause again, I didn't rerun this because of download times and stuff like that. But we did, I did it five times and we can see that the loss is actually gone lower on every epoch, which is good. And the accuracy is also going up and then it drops back down, but the accuracy is only 3%. So while the loss keeps going lower, the accuracy is really, really low. So the gist of this is that this neural network is terrible. <laughs> uh, for any kind of image classification task, you could probably expect to at least get 90% for a lot of problems. For this data set, I'm sure that there are ways to get, you know, 98% maybe. I don't know what the actual like state of the art, like best performing model is, but this is not about how to make a really good neural network. This is about how to make a neural network. So I'm sure there's all other things you could do. Like this could be a convolutional neural network instead maybe, or 
change something about these uh, layers, maybe not applying linear transformations, applying some other kind, maybe not using this value function, using something different. But that's how you build a neural network and train it. And this is something that people use a lot and just to give them a sense of how the neural network is doing, or you might plot it. You can also plot this information. Like you can plot your loss. You can, as long as you see it going down, it's good. Your accuracy, same thing. If it goes up, it's good. I'm going to now switch over back to my slides because we're over time. And I want, I just have a couple closing thoughts. Okay, screen share is loading. Okay, so closing thoughts. Uh, yeah, so if you wanna gain some expertise in PyTorch, here are some additional resources. Um, there are some videos and blogs that I really like. Uh, one, first one is the PyTorch official documentation. That is a great place to go. And it will kind of walk you through similar things, tensors, data sets, transforms and building neural networks. And then it has lots of great examples of building more advanced neural networks or building better neural networks, debugging neural networks, um, how to you know, use GPUs, there's some stuff there. Then there's also learnpytorch.io. It's like a PyTorch mastery course, I think is really good. And then there's this really interesting one called MiniTorch, which shows you like how PyTorch works internally and how it does like the back back propagation internally, how it does stuff with tensors internally. Um, it's a great way to get like a level one level lower instead of just importing all these things from the library and then you know calling functions. Like you can have a better sense of what it's actually doing. Uh, Sebastian Raska, if I'm saying their name right, um, is also a person who's pretty well known for being knowledgeable about PyTorch. They have a blog. PyTorch Lightning, I believe Sebastian works there now as well. And then if you want to do more work with tensors and NumPy, there's a link to this GitHub repository um, from a, actually a former colleague of mine called Foundations of Numerical Computing that I really, really like and gets you used to the idea of working with arrays and thinking about uh, NumPy arrays or tensors. And then there's two books. Uh, there's Deep Learning with PyTorch and Deep Learning for Coders with Fast AI and PyTorch. And as far as slides go, I think that is it. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. And as soon as it's done, yeah, cool. I'm going to also stop recording. And thank you all for coming.